Hey everybody, my name is Chad and I'm the pastor of Creekside Bible Church. Today I want to talk to you about an answer to one of life's great questions. How did we get here? At our church, we recently started a series of sermons that really look at answering this other question. Who is Jesus? I'm convinced that in our modern American culture, we are really good about knowing about people, like what people do. But we're also really bad about trying to understand who people are. And sadly, this oftentimes applies to how we think about Jesus. We know a lot about what Jesus did, but we know little about who Jesus is. I think that when this is true in our lives, it makes what he did even less impactful. It is important if we're going to be impacted by the work of Jesus to understand who Jesus is. Is. There's this point that I wish I would have made in my first sermon in this series. I had it written down, but I didn't make it. And I want to make it to you now. At the center of Christianity is a who and not just a what. At the center of Christianity is a who and not just a what. And that who is Jesus. I think it's important to iterate a couple of other things from my first sermon in this series called The Word, where we're answering this question, who is Jesus? John refers to Jesus as the Word, and he tells us that before creation existed, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here's a couple of big ideas for those of you that didn't see the first sermon in this series. The first is, the being we celebrate at Christmas existed before creation. I really think we should be in awe of this idea. The being that we celebrate at Christmas existed before creation. The person that we call Jesus, that we, that we think about being conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, he existed before creation. There's another thing that I think is important to say again, and that's this. The answers to the questions you ask about God can be found in Jesus. This was really the big idea of my first sermon. The answers to the questions you ask about God can be found in Jesus. We all have questions about God. Does he really exist? Does he care about people? Does he care about me? Is he alive and active in the world or is he just distant and kind of uh, ruling over us? All of these questions can be answered in Jesus. That's part of who Jesus is. Arthur Pink, an author who writes about the book of John, says this, If the believer would enter into a better, deeper, fuller knowledge of God, he must prayerfully study the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in the scriptures. Let this be made our chief business, our great delight, to reverently scrutinize and meditate upon the excellencies of our divine Savior as they are displayed upon the the pages of Holy Writ. Then, and only then, shall we increase in the knowledge of God. The answers to the questions you ask about God can be found in Jesus. And in the passage we're going to look at today, John 1, 3 through 5, the author really builds upon this idea. And how here's how it starts. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Who is Jesus? He is the one that created all that is in existence. In fact, the wording in this verse makes that really emphatic. Notice that it isn't just that he made all things, but that nothing was made without him. It could be read like this. All things were made by him, and what was made was in no way made without him. Jesus is the creator of all that exists. Who is Jesus? He is the creator of everything. This is really important. It just feels important. But you may ask, well, why is that idea important? And I think it's important because of that big question. How did we get here? Everybody wonders, how did we get here? How did I come to exist? There's this thing in apologetics, which is the study of how to defend the faith, called the cosmological argument. And it's an argument that I think in some ways most people would agree with. The cosmological argument is this. Point one, everything that begins has a cause. Point two, 
the universe began to exist. Point three, therefore, the universe has a cause. The universe has a cause. Most people would agree to this point, and the question that people ask, smart people ask, is what is the cause? Or in other words, what is the uncaused cause? As I was studying for this sermon, it took me to this comment section on uh, what it was a really smart sounding comment section where people were really trying to answer this question what is the uncaused cause that caused creation, that caused the universe? People gave all of these ideas and they were really fascinating. And again, these people sounded very smart. They, they gave the option of a white hole. I don't even know what that is, but I need to look it up. They, they talked about potentiality and they talked about time and somebody just said, nothing is nothing. Now, there's a lot more on this topic of the cosmological argument in a Bible study that one of the pastors at our church did last year. Matt Kenairi did a Bible study called Apologetics for the 21st Century and he dives deeply into the cosmological argument. If you have not been a, watched that Bible study, I could not recommend anything more for watching this week. Look it up. Find it on our YouTube page. Uh, it's called Apologetics for the 21st Century. And I, I absolutely think it will be worth your time to watch the four sessions in that Bible study. They're about an hour long, and they are so important and so relevant for answering hard questions like, how did we get here? But today, I don't want to dive so deeply into the cosmological argument. I don't want to take a, a broad look at what the uncaused cause is, or as Aristotle said, the unmoved mover of all the motion in the universe. Instead, I just want to point your attention to how the author of John answers the question, what is the uncaused cause? He says, Jesus. Jesus. Now, you might dismiss that. You might say, I, I don't believe that's right. And, and that's okay. But, but, but even then, I would encourage you to really think about the weight of a person answering the question of what the uncaused cause is simply by saying it is Jesus. You know, uh, even great scientists will will. will take causes back and back and back and eventually they run into this this point in in their progression where where they just say the big bang theory and 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 still leaves out this question hanging in the air well well what was the cause of of the cause of the big bang and, and this author the author of the book of John comes along and he says it's Jesus now before you just say ah, another Jesus answer. I mean, before you said, oh, that's so Sunday school of an answer. I would just want to point your attention to this thing that I think is so, 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 so important. And that is that this author that writes this, that writes that Jesus is the uncaused cause, knew Jesus personally, loved Jesus, was loved by Jesus, was friends with Jesus. Now think about that for a minute. Is there any friend in your life, the person that you love most, pick them maybe, would you ever, would you ever, ever, ever have the audacity to declare that they are the uncaused cause that caused all that has been created, that caused all that exists? No, right? For the author of John to make this declaration about Jesus, he must have seen and heard the most amazing things, things that would allow him to say this in good faith. This guy who knew Jesus, who was friends with Jesus, writes this book talking about who Jesus is, and he begins it in part in the prologue by saying that Jesus is the uncaused cause. Jesus is your creator. And what's great for us if, you, if you're a person who's a Christian, I think this is great. Or if you're a person who hears this and says, that's such a weird idea that Jesus was, would be the uncaused cause. What's great for us is that this entire book that we are going to study through, the book that is called John, is written in part to prove that this is true. Is written in part 
to show us the things that the author of John saw that would allow for him to make this incredible, audacious declaration about who Jesus is. And then the author in verse 4 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Now, life and light are major themes in the book of John. We'll just touch on that a little bit in a few moments. But if you'll be with us for these sermons as as we move our way through the book of John, as I and others preach from the book of John, if you'll stay with us, then you're going to see light and life come up over and over and over again. But as you read it in verse 4, it's interesting because there's a couple of different ways that we can read it. And there's a couple of different ways that even first century readers of this book would have read it. One author called it a masterpiece of planned ambiguity. For a first century reader with no background of Christianity, it would simply draw people's minds to creation. John has just said that Jesus is the uncaused cause, that he is the creator of all. And for a person first reading this with no theology background, no Christian background, no church background, they would say, well, this is about creation. He's saying life and light comes from Jesus. I think about Jewish people who who maybe didn't have a Christian background. Their minds would have immediately gone to the creation story of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We've already seen that before this, Jesus was, but now listen to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. For a person that doesn't have a background in Christianity or who has never read through the book of John, they're going to look at this declaration of him being li- in ha- of Jesus having life and light within him or life within him that, that is light for all mankind. And they're going to say, wow, this reminds me of creation. And they are going to recognize that again, John is declaring that physically, both life and light come from Jesus. Jesus is the source of our lives, and Jesus is the source of the light, that which makes it makes us able to see. D.A. Carson says, Just as in Genesis, where everything that came into being did so because of God's spoken word, and just as in Proverbs 3, 19 and 8, 30, where wisdom personified is the means by which all exists, So here, God's word, understood in the prologue to be a personal agent, Jesus, created everything. This idea is clear throughout the New Testament. The writers who write about Jesus and the importance of Jesus in the Bible, they they make this idea that Jesus is the creator just super clear. Uh, It's in a lot of places, but perhaps most clearly, it's in Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And so one way to read this verse, one correct way to read this verse is to recognize that John is doubling down on what he has just said. Nothing's been created without Jesus. In fact, he is the very source of life and that life is the light of all mankind. Kind. But Christian readers, or anybody who has read the book of John before, will see more in this because of how important the themes of life and light are in the book. Life and light can be read in physical terms, but they also can be read and maybe should be read in spiritual terms. Life is used 41 times in the book of John. John 3, 16, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Life in the book of John is this this abundant, eternal connection to God that comes through Jesus. This abundant and eternal connection to God that comes through 
Jesus. It doesn't just start after this life is over. It starts now as we enter into a relationship with God by believing that Jesus has died for our sins and come back to life so that we may have life too. The light is also an incredibly important theme. John 1 makes a big deal about Jesus being the light, even the true light, as we'll talk about later in this series. The light is hated by those who do evil. Light is something that we can have or be connected to. And Jesus is the light, the meaning of light in the Gospel of John. That's a master's thesis that I stumbled upon when studying for this sermon. It says, the presence of God is light. The spiritual illumination is light from God. Righteous life is light from God. And the agent of salvation is light. Light is basically all that is good and the source of that which is good, which we see here and in other places, is Jesus. All of it makes the following declaration of Jesus make sense. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Jesus is not only the source of life, he is the source of Light is the source of that which is good. So you ask, who is Jesus? He is the source of life and light. He is the source of our physical lives, the light that perhaps exists in the world, but maybe the light that exists in us, like that, the the light of life, if you will. But he is also the source of our spiritual lives and that which is good, or at least he can be if we will place our faith in him. I would say to you as you answer the question, who is Jesus? Yes, Jesus is the creator of all, but also Jesus can be the source of an abundant life that is eternally connected to God, and he can be the source of good in your life. When you answer the question, who is Jesus? He isn't just our creator. He isn't just the one who got brought us life physically, but he is the one who can bring us life and light spiritually too. And then there's this great piece of news in verse five. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. In contrast to light is darkness. Darkness is the opposite of light. More accurately, perhaps, it is the absence of light. And I think the following verse helps us to get an idea of what John is talking about when he says darkness. In John 3, 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. We will come back to the meaning of this passage later as we study through the book of John, but notice that dark is the opposite of light. It's the opposite of what we've already described light being. It is the absence of God, the lack of spiritual illumination, evil, and that which opposes the true light, who is Jesus, that which opposes Jesus. And and what 3.19 says, John 3.19 says basically that people are often drawn to the dark because their deeds are evil. Now that's an interesting idea to me when coupled with what we're talking about today. Jesus, according to the author of John, is the uncaused cause, the creator of everything. And people are so quick to reject that idea without even exploring whether or not it is true. They'll accept things like time being the uncaused cause or a a white hole, which again, I don't even know what that is, or potentiality. They'll accept those things on faith. They'll accept the Big Bang idea on faith, but they'll reject Jesus as if it's a stupid idea. And I think that that when we look through the book of John, we will find in the amazing stories of Jesus' life, the amazing and I believe true stories of Jesus' life, that it is not illogical to believe that he is the uncaused cause. It is not more, I would say it is less illogical to Believe in other things as the uncaused cause, as the creator of all, than it is to believe that Jesus is the one who created everything. The reason I think that people are so quick to accept those other things by faith and not Jesus is because their deeds, our deeds, are evil. If a white hole 
is the uncaused cause, then I don't need to change a single thing about my life. If a white hole is the uncaused cause, then you don't have to deal with the ramifications of the Bible being true. You don't need to make any change in your life. You never need to think about eternity. You never need to think about the spiritual. You never need to worry about whether you are living your life in a way that pleases the God above. But if Jesus is the uncaused cause, that that calls you to give everything to him. It calls you to change many things about your life. It calls you to, to make the, the first desire of your life to please and honor him as your creator. If you're a person who, who's you know stuck with me this far into the sermon, but you're like, I, you know, I've rejected Jesus for a really long time and this whole thing doesn't align with science and all that. I would just ask you to consider maybe whether you're so quick to reject Jesus despite a friend of his declaring him as the uncaused cause and writing down all the things that made him believe that. Not because it's illogical, irrational, unscientific, but because you don't want to deal with the ramifications of it being true. You don't want to have to deal with what it means for your life if Jesus truly is the uncaused cause. Now, if you identify that in yourself, man, I would hope that you would take another step and just say, perhaps maybe I should let my guard down and, and examine whether or not it's really true. I would hope that you'd be a person who wants the truth even, even if there are consequences for your life. Now, here's, here's the good news that I would share with you. I think that the consequences that you fear giving your life to Jesus, living your life for Jesus will actually make your life much more full, much more abundant, much better because Jesus is the source of all that is truly good. He is the source of life and light. And so those fears, I would hope that you put them down and you examine whether the declaration of John that Jesus is the uncaused cause is true or not true. Now, I have some good news for those of you who are Christians already, and that is what John says in verse 5 is that the darkness has not overcome the light. I think we live in a time in our country's history, for those of you that are in America watching online, you, you'll probably agree with this. If you're somewhere else, I can't speak to that, but we live in a time in our country's history where it feels like darkness, that which opposes Good, that which opposes Jesus is engulfing us. But John says the darkness has not overcome the light. This word overcome is interesting because it contains the idea of grasped or seized. And when applied to darkness, it gives off the idea of eclipsing. The darkness has not eclipsed the light. Uh, some of you will remember that several years ago we had the... Uh, amazing experience of having a full eclipse uh, right here in our own backyard on the 45th parallel just down the road in, in the Salem-Kaiser area where I grew up. And I remember going down there that day and, uh, and you know, kind of having low expectations for this incredible thing that was going to happen in, in the world. And, uh, and and we sat there and we waited and, and you know, the the eclipse started and nothing, but then when the full eclipse hit, it was this incredibly awesome experience. It was like all the light went away. It was really cool. It was really profound. But when it comes to Jesus, John is saying that the darkness has not, and I would say he would add, will not overcome the light. While we live in a time where it seems like the darkness is growing, there will never be a full eclipse of Jesus and that which he offers to the world. For those of us who are Christians, we believe that the light lives within us and should shine out of us. And, and I think that this author from the very beginning wants you to know that while the darkness, that which opposed Jesus, it fought hard against him. I mean, it fought so hard against him. It tried to eclipse him so passionately that it nails him to a cross. 
and buried him in a grave so that he could shine no more. But the darkness still could not overcome him. It could not overcome the light. Because three days later, Jesus came back from the dead and the light shined forth once again. And while you may feel the darkness taking hold in our country or maybe in your life, when you have Jesus in your life, the darkness cannot and will not overpower, overcome, or eclipse the light that is within you. Jesus is the one who overcomes and the one who can help you overcome the bad that exists on earth. Who is Jesus? He is the uncaused cause. He is the life and light, and he is the one who overcomes. And so what must you do with this? First, man, if you're not a Christian, please at least consider becoming a Christian. Consider becoming a Christian. Because that question that every person will ask at some point in life, how did I get here? This author, the author of John who knew Jesus, saw enough to say, I have found the uncaused cause. I have found the creator of everything, and his name is Jesus. And if that is true, then it demands that you consider all the rest of the story, the book of John. You, you follow along and you see where it leads, and I'll tell you where it leads. It leads. It leads to a choice of whether or not you will accept Jesus as your Savior because he dies on a cross for your sins or not become a Christian. If not, if not, if you're if you're unwilling to do that today, then then at least consider coming through us, coming with us on this journey through the book of John, reading the book of John on yourself, and at least asking the question, can it be true that Jesus is the uncaused cause? Perhaps you'll pray, even if you don't believe that God exists, and say, God, if you are real, and Jesus, if you are really the uncaused cause, then make yourself known to me. And for those of us who are Christians, I would just say this. Stop trying to find life and light in things that are not Jesus. We try to find the abundance that Jesus offers for our life. We try to find that which is good in just about every other place besides Jesus. When we get stressed out about the world, we open a fiction book and try to forget about it, or, or you know, maybe perhaps worse, we turn on Netflix and just try to find something happy to watch. We try to find it in, in our politicians or in uh, celebrities, and we try to find good in so many places. And there is good in so many places because Jesus has given his light to many people. But the source of that light is where we should most often turn our attention. And the source of life and light is Jesus. So Christians, as you feel the darkness well in your soul or rise around you in our country and in this world, turn your eyes to the source of life and light. Turn your attention to Jesus. Let me pray for those of you who aren't Christians and those of you who are that we will do these things, that you will do these things. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving us light, for choosing to create us. You didn't even need to make us, Lord, but you made us anyway. I pray, Lord, for those that, that don't believe in you, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would compel them to, to at least examine, but hopefully to believe that you are the uncaused cause. And as they believe that, then they, God, would follow that by coming to believe that you, Jesus, are the only hope for salvation. You are the only hope for life and true goodness that will last for eternity. For those of us who are Christians, Lord, I know so many people are stressed, they're worried, they're fearful, they're scared, and they're trying to find glimmers of hope, glimmers of light, God. And I pray that, that now, this week, and, in, and forever, God, that they would not look for it in all of the other, all the other places that... that, that people apart from you look, but they would turn their attention to you. They would open up the book of John and see your goodness and be filled in a new way, God, with your, with your light. And Lord, finally, I think of this now, I don't know why, but I think about how, God, you have, you have called us to be 
the light. We are to be reflections of your light. We are to be uh, illuminations, lampstands, God, as you say in the book of Revelation, of the light that is you. We are to be a city on a hill, God, showing you off. And I pray for those of us who are Christians that we would do that in this passage would be a reminder for us to do that. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if God has used my sermon to impact you in any way, if, if you're ready to declare Jesus as the uncaused cause, or maybe you've even taken a step further and you want to become a Christian, or maybe you haven't gone that far, but you just say, maybe I'll explore whether Jesus is the uncaused cause. Uh, or perhaps you are a Christian and you've said today, you know what, I haven't turned my attention to Jesus. I've had my attention on everything else and I'm, I'm focused more on the darkness than the light and I need, to, I need to make that change in my life. If God has used my sermon to impact you, I would love for you to let me know. You can go to creekside.me slash respond, creekside.me slash respond and fill out the form there. I'd love to talk with you, to pray with you. To, to discuss these things or to just be there to listen to you, whatever it might be. But please let me know by going to creekside.me slash respond. Thank you for watching, everybody. God bless.